In AP Statistics, we start out with chapter four, which is all about experimental design that we just finished. And we do that because it gives us a better sense of the big picture of what we're working towards. There's a lot of chances for you guys to think critically and have good discussions and all that, but it gives us an idea of our big picture. After we finish that chapter, now we're back in chapter one, and from here on out, we just follow the book in the order that it's written. Um, and chapter one lays a lot of foundational skills that we will use for the entire rest of the class. A big focus of this chapter is in making graphs, and we do a lot of things with graphs that help us analyze data. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. The first big fundamental vocabulary concept of this chapter, really important, that follow, follows us through the entire class, is the difference between a categorical and a quantitative variable. A categorical variable is a variable that can be broken into categories, as you might guess from the name. So it can be broken into groups or categories. Um, so to make a quick example of a categorical variable, let's say I was asking you for your year in school. You're going to tell me you're a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, or a senior. You can break that up into categories right there. That's a categorical variable. A quantitative variable, on the other hand, um, takes on numerical values where an average would make sense. And I'll clarify what that means in just a second here. But it takes on numbers, okay? So a quantitative variable takes on numbers. But sometimes kids think, oh, it's a number, got to automatically be quantitative. That's why that second part is in there, where it makes sense that you would average your values, okay? So I gave the example a minute ago about how freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, your year in school is a categorical variable, but you know you can look at that as ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. So if you gave me a number for your answer for what year in school, oh, I'm 11th grade, um, that's still a categorical variable. Because if I average all of your 9s, 10s, 11s, and 12s, I get like 10 point something. I get something that means nothing to me, okay? So just because something is a number, telephone number is another example. It's a number, but you can't like average them or do math with them. You can still have numbers that are categorical. But when you think quantitative, think numbers where you're taking on values that you can actually average. So there's a big old list right here of all these possible variables. And write down really quickly, pause me and write down a C or a Q next to each of these for categorical or quantitative to practice. So you should have already jotted these down here, but I'm gonna go ahead and write down answers. Eye color clearly going to be a categorical variable. Your blue, brown, black, whatever color of your eyes are, it is a category. Weight is a quantitative variable. I weigh 164, 189, 127. You're giving me a number. And if we all took our numbers and we averaged them, we would get something meaningful. The average weight of this group of people is X. ACT score is also going to be quantitative. You give me a number, and if we average them, we can figure out our average ACT score, and that would give us something of value. So that's definitely quantitative. Zip code, 63143, or whatever zip code you guys are going to give me here, but if we average those, we don't get anything of value. Zip code is a, quant sorry, a categorical variable. Even though it's a number, it doesn't really make sense to average them. Shoe size, um, your size six, seven, eight, nine. Um, you could maybe argue on this one back and forth, but I would say you can still get something of value. Like on average, we wear a size nine shoe. So I'm gonna call that a quantitative variable. Month of birth, I'm born in December, so I'm a 12. You're born in June, you're a six. If we average all of those, we're gonna get six point something in the middle, which tells us nothing. So even though it is a number, this is another example of a categorical variable in disguise. And then lastly here, age. Age, where you break it up into groups though. So you're gonna tell me you're between zero and nine, or you're between 10 and 19, or you're between 20 and 29. If you say just, hey, what's your age? And you give me a number. Oh, I'm 17. 
we could average those and it would be fine. That's a quantitative variable. But you can take a quantitative variable and break it into little groups like they did right there. This makes it a categorical variable. Oh, I'm between zero and nine. There are this many people here. I'm between 10 and 19, et cetera. So you can take a variable with numbers and make it categorical if you break it up into chunks. Last thing on this slide is a vocab word, which is a distribution. And a distribution is just a way of listing all possible, uh, all possible values a variable can take along with their frequency. So basically what a distribution does is it writes down everything that can happen for a variable. And then it writes down, um, a lot of times it will write down the uh, frequency of with which it occurs. So, um, 30% of the class has blue eyes or 30 out of 90 kids have blue eyes or whatever. So you're basically listing all the possibilities for a variable. When you talk about a distribution, it's basically just game planning what your variable can do. So let's keep it moving on to the next slide here. And this slide has a table up top right here. It's info about eight randomly selected U.S. residents from the 2000 census. And there's a bunch of different variables and things that we're collecting data points about these eight people. So who are the individuals in this data set? It's going to be eight randomly selected people. So eight random U.S. residents. And each person is a row. So if I look at this entire row right here, all of that corresponds to an individual. So that's an individual. The next one's an individual, et cetera, et cetera. So each row is a person. Each row is an individual. All right. What variables are measured? identify each as categorical quantitative. I'm not going to write all of these out right here, but you guys probably should, or at least make note of them. The variables are going to be the things along the top right here. You have states, you have number of family members, age, gender, marital status, income, travel to work. So we are asking each person in this study for seven different pieces of information, hence seven different variables. So with each of those variables, um, let's identify them as categorical or quantitative. State, obviously categorical. Number of family members, quantitative. Age is quantitative. Gender is categorical categorical, quantitative, and quantitative. No particularly tricky ones that you could argue over, I don't think, in that list. And then it says to display the distribution of gender and number of family members for the individuals in the sample. When it talks about displaying the distribution, displaying the distribution, generally you're either going to make a table or you're going to make a graph. More commonly, since we already have a table here, we're going to make a graph for these. Now, I'm not going to make these super fancy. We'll get to this in more detail. And some of these graphs you guys have been making since like elementary school, like one of them is a bar graph. You guys have been doing it for years, dot plots, which we've done in this class already. Um, but let's talk about our variables with gender in this problem. And by the way, um, when we talk about gender in AP statistics, a lot of these problems treat gender as a binary variable, male, female. And um, this is done, and like I know that that's not with modern day, like that's, that's not the right thing to just look at it as a binary um, option. So forgive me if there are problems that do treat it as such. Um, there's problems that are trying to be more progressive. And when I remember, I try to include that. But if it appears that gender is ever binary, like that's not like a statement or anything like that. That's just the way that the problem was structured here. So anyway, gender is definitely going to be a categorical variable. In this problem, it's only allotted two choices here, and a lot of official surveys do only give you those options. So the best way to treat a categorical variable, there's a couple different kinds of graphs we can use, um, and we'll talk about those later on in the slides. I would probably do a bar graph for this one. You would have your male, you would have your female. And then the y-axis right here could be the frequency 
um, of how many people have that. So you would do tick marks um, and I would just want to count up. I think there's three males here. So I'd have like a little bar going up to three and then my female would go up to five. It's not very hard to make a bar graph. You've done it since elementary school, but bar graphs work really well for categorical variables like gender. Then I also asked you to graph the number of family members. And number of family members is a quantitative variable, takes on numbers. Easiest quantitative graph, although there are more that we'll talk about later, is to do a dot plot like we did first chapter. So number of family members can be anywhere from one to, I think there's a six, four, five, six. And all you would do is put a dot for each person. Oh, the first person has two, the second person has six. Then there's a three, then there's another three. So I made a bar graph for this, and I made a dot plot for this. When they ask you to display a distribution, graphing is great. There are other options we will discuss, but there's just two easy ways you can graph stuff. So let's keep these slides going here. You have three kinds of tables on this slide, and they are called data tables, frequency tables and relative frequency tables. The data table is right here at the bottom. So we're just gonna kind of label these here. What is the difference between these three types? This is the data table. Data table is when you have just your raw data. So when you collect your data and you're organizing it, it's just like in a little pile right there. Your raw data is a data table. And then what we have going on here, it says it on the slides, but on your slides, it might be hard to read. This guy right here is a frequency table. Frequency involves the counts. Now this is a different variable than the census data we were looking at here. This is about number of stations on our radio for different types of music or something like that. When you see the word frequency, it means that you're counting. And if you look right here, they counted how many are adult contemporary, how many are adult standards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the counter, the raw number is the frequency table, okay? Then you have a relative frequency table. And the word relative frequency means a percentage. So when you see relative frequency, they're talking about percent. So they turned these into percentages, the same data set here, 11.2% of stations are adult contemporary, etc. So we will talk about when each of these is a good thing. I actually ask about it right here at the bottom. So um, frequency is best when you care about the totals. So you need to know the totals. Um, which can be a thing. Like if I was looking at my school, like or graphing our class data, I might want to know the frequency of you who got an A on a quiz. The percentage isn't as important when I'm looking at like just my class. It's like, okay, yeah, nine of you got A's. Okay, yeah, six of you got B's, et cetera. Relative frequency is better for comparison. So relative frequency is better for comparing especially when the groups are different sizes. So it's especially when groups are different sizes. So if I look at this list of numbers right here, and wow, 13,000 stations, 750 stations are Spanish language. If I don't know much about the radio, okay, 750, like, is that good? Is that bad? Is that a lot? Is it not? It's easier to look at it as a percentage. So when you have a big number like that, oh, 5.4% of stations are Spanish language. Or if I'm comparing two different groups, like, let's say I wanted to know what percent of my AP stats kids get A's and what percent of my Algebra 2 kids get A's. I have a lot more Algebra 2 kids. So if I'm like 40 Algebra 2 kids and eight AP Stats kids, they're different playing fields. So that's hard to compare well. You would want to turn them into percentages. Oh, 50% of my Algebra 2 kids. Oh, 50% of my AP Stats kids. And it's easier to compare. So when you're comparing groups of different sizes, you want percents. We use percents a lot more in AP Stats than we use frequencies, but both do have their values. All right. So what else do I got here? Bar graphs versus pie charts. Good slide here. What I have is the same data on music and bar graphs and pie charts are both for categorical variables. 
So you can graph uh, choice of music is a categorical variable, country, rock, whatever. So that is categorical. And you can graph a categorical variable with a bar graph or with a pie chart. Overwhelmingly, bar graphs are better. So bar graphs are way better. Why are they way better? Well, if I look at this pie chart right here, and I wanted to see what's the biggest or most popular choice. I would have to kind of eyeball it and look, oh, this could be the biggest, or maybe it's this one, or maybe it's this one. When you look at those three, they all look kind of close to the same, and it's hard to tell without like sitting there and squinting, oh, maybe that's a little bit bigger. When you look at a bar graph, it hits you in the face. Well, that's the tallest bar. I guess news and talk is the biggest. Well, second tallest bar right there. Bar graphs are better for comparisons. So you're going to always want to use a bar graph, plus bar graphs are easier to make. Pie charts look really nice. Like it's like, wow, they made a pie chart. They're really fancy. They know what they're talking about. So in like a, if you're doing like a presentation for something, pie charts are good for like wowing people. They just look fancy, but they're not very good for statistical analysis. And no matter which kind of graph you use, what is the most important thing to remember? You need to make sure you label things well. This is not a very good pie chart because it doesn't tell you what percentage each of these is. It really should have, oh yeah, that's 12.1%, oh, that's 9.6, etc. This graph is better because it has that scaling right here so you can see what percentage each group is in. So labels are huge when you make graphs and make sure, um, given the choice, bar graphs are just better than pie charts. So our last big topic of this lesson is talking about how graphs can be misleading. Both of these graphs here that you see express the same data. It's on your previous type of computer that people owned and they gave a survey. Both are in percents. Look at those two graphs and think about why one is misleading, which one is misleading and why, okay? So now I'm actually gonna talk about this here. One misleading thing about this picture, probably the biggest one, is the scaling. This guy starts at zero, this guy starts at 10. And what it does when you start at 10 right here is it really kind of makes PC look like it's nothing at all. PC looks like insignificant right here and it looks like the nun is like three or four times as big. This looks way bigger than this guy right here. Obviously Mac is the most popular in both, but if you look at this one, it looks like this is like four times as big. When you look at the actual numbers, this might be like a 12, this might be like an 18%. So if there's a difference, none is bigger, but it's not that much bigger like you see right here. So you need to be careful about scaling and skipping marks. It's not like the second graph is like per wrong per se, like it's not saying something incorrect, but it's definitely trying to make you think that PC is worse than it actually is. So when you make a graph, your duty is kind of to make it in an unbiased way. So you're not like trying to push people towards a certain conception, like misconception. Um, you need to be careful with this though, because it does a pop up a lot in advertising. While us as statisticians, we're supposed to be like unbiased and just show things like they really are. Companies can try to fool you and try to make you think a certain way to sell you their product. And I have an example of that on the last page. So our last thing going with these slides here, this is an actual advertisement from um, DirecTV at one point, and it's talking about the number of channels that each of these stations have. So if you look, there are 95 channels in the DirecTV, there's 81 over here, and there's 56 over here. So we have DirecTV, Dish Network, Cable. Clearly the image, like just by looking at the number of channels, DirecTV apparently has the most, okay? But there's a few issues, and think about this, pause me, think about it, think it through before I tell you the answer here. But not only, so there's two issues here. One issue is the scaling of the y-axis right here. If this is a 95, how could this be 81 and this be 56? That doesn't make any sense. So their vertical scaling here, so vertical scaling doesn't exist, or it's misleading. So they purposely, they didn't make this like to scale right here. This 95 versus this 81, like that's almost twice as big as the 81 in the height. That's not right. 
There's a second thing though that's also misleading about it that's a little more subtle. And that is that they bring in a second dimension. Even if the heights were cool, this bar is way wider than the other two. So when you look at like area, this takes up like way more of the picture than these other little guys right here. So it's not okay to bring in a second dimension. So shouldn't, or the bars should be the same width. You have to be careful about bringing an extra dimension in because it makes it look that much better than the other ones. You'll also see this in like cutesy graphs. Like let's say I was a milk company or something like that. And I think my milk is the best. You'll see like little jars of milk. Here's my sweet jar. Like, oh yeah, this is the, this is our milk right here. And then they'll do like a smaller one. Oh, that's the other companies. And it'll be like looking at this right here. Like this might even be to scale, but this one is just so much wider that it makes it look that much better. So be very cautious and just think it through when you're looking at a graph that a company is giving to you because a company frequently has incentive to make you think a certain way. So definitely take the time to pause and look at a graph and see if there's anything funny going on before you use what it is saying.